Good evening. I'm Judy Tate. I am the producing artistic director of the American Slavery Project, and I am humbled that so many of you would choose to spend your Juneteenth Friday evening with us, listening to our three short radio dramas, Black Women and the Ballot. I also want to thank our 16 partners. I think that might be unprecedented for 16 companies to come together to present one work. We really appreciate your generosity, your work, your effort to get the word out to promote this. We're a very small theater company and we had this work and it was very easy because we are small to pivot into a, cha a change of content and a change of delivery. And we're glad that our partners saw the value in that and came aboard with us. The American Slavery Project was created during the sesquicentennial of the Civil War and we were frightened when we saw what was happening. Uh, so we decided to do something about it. And so we are a theatrical response to revisionism in this country's conversation around enslavement and its aftermath, Jim Crow, the civil rights era, even up to today. Black lives matter, they have always mattered, and it is black people largely in this country that have, con that has, that have continually forced this country to reckon with its past and to live up to its original promise. Now tonight, you're going to see three very different plays. The first one by Saviana Stanescu and performed by Lynette R. Freeman is called Don't Dream. And it is takes place in a world that we don't often see dramatized, and I think we should the world of domestic workers, who people just recently have realized are essential to our society. But often these workers are dis, uh, in, disenfranchised because they are often undocumented. Um, and I think this play dramatizes this very, very beautifully. Our second uh, centerpiece play is In the Parlor, directed by Diane Kirksey Floyd, written by Judy Tate, and um, takes place in the parlor of a very, very adamant Howard University student in 1913 who entertains three very, very heavy hitter guests. Mary Church Terrell will be played by Meseret Stroman Wheeler, Nellie Quander by Celestine Ray, um, Edna Brown, whose home it is, by Gabrielle C. Archer, and Alice Paul, the famous suffragette, will be played by Montana Lambert Hoover. The third play is Three Generations of Black Women Recalling their first time voting, and we want to welcome Felicia Rashad. Without Felicia Rashad, I bet a lot of you will not be here tonight. <laughs> she was so wonderful to work with, so kind, so generous, so talented, such a team player, and we're so happy to have her part of the ASP family. Now, I will see you in about um, 40, 45 minutes maybe. And we're going to have a quick transition into a panel discussion. There will be a representative from Delta Sigma Theta. After you see the plays, you'll understand why. The panel discussion will be uh, moderated by our good friend, Melissa Maxwell. And there will be actors on the panel from the plays. I have disabled the chat function for tonight um, on YouTube. Um, we are the American Slavery Project, and we get a fair number of racist trolls. So I would rather not give them a platform. But if you guys have questions and want to um, respond to the plays, you are welcome to tweet at us at amslaveryproj, at Am slavery P R O J. We'll get them and we will answer your questions.
questions and uh, accept your kindnesses or your criticism. I don't care, but I'm just not putting it on YouTube channel. <laughs> I'll see you later. Please enjoy Black Women and the Ballot. Five a.m. Wake up. Cold floor. Barefoot. Door squeaks. Quiet. No wake up kids. Go kitchen. Clean sink. Mrs. Always gets mad at the sink is dirty. Make eggs. Warm milk. Six a.m. Wake kids. Wash kids, wash ears, wash neck. Toast bread, cereals. Captain Crunch. Spill milk, little Johnny cry. Shh, no wake missus. Wipe table. Kids eat, hit me. Say, stupid. I'm no stupid. Call me, may do this, do that. May not my name. Help kids dress. T-shirt, jeans, socks, shoes, backpack, ready. Bus comes, kids go. 7 a.m. Clean sink. Mrs. Always gets mad. If they <laughs> let dogs sparky out. Fresh morning air. Good. Enough. Hurry. Back. 7.30. Wake Mrs. and Mr. Make breakfast. Omelette. Spinach cheese for Mrs. Ham peppers for Mr. Ah, Mrs. yells. Sink no clean. Oh, no. Little piece of pepper there. Coffee. Mr. spills. Mrs. mad. They argue. Big day today. Vote day. More coffee. 9 a.m. Mrs. Clean sink. Start laundry. To garage. Wash car. Vacuum living room. Hallway. Kids room. Four bathrooms. No gloves. Clean toilet. Sink. Scrub floor. Get corners. Mrs. Always checks corners. Finish laundry. Start iron. Radio. Vote, vote, vote. Ah, too loud. Big day today. Vote day. Oh, don't forget to change toilet paper. 1 p.m. Kids back. Make lunch. Clean kitchen. Put kids sleep nap. Finish iron. Go out. Fresh air, good. <laughs> Flowers, bees, butterflies, <gasps> neighbors' hacks, <laughs> nice colors. Ah, hurry, clip bushes, kids wake, want snack, make sandwich, clean sink, clean table. Kids play living room, kids make mess living room. 6 p.m. Mrs. and Mr. Back. Stickers. Nice colors. I voted. Hmm. Ah, Mr. Throws stickers in garbage. They argue. Clean living room. Cook dinner. Clean kitchen. Oven. Floor. Sink. Mrs. Always gets mad if the sink is dirty. Take garbage out. Save stickers. Nice colors. I voted. <laughs> A set table. Bring food. Sauce pasta no good. Mrs. Angry. Ah, make new sauce. Family eat. I serve. Clean kitchen. Oven, floor, sink. Mrs. Always gets mad if the sink is dirty. Take dog Sparky out. Fresh air. 
good. Hurry. 9 p.m. Kids go bed. Ugh, not yet. Big day today. Vote day. More iron. Bath for Mrs. Help Mrs. Hair dry. Rub Mrs. Feet. 10 p.m. Mrs. and Mr. go bedrooms. Uh, not yet. Big day today. Vote day. Family watch TV. They argue. Clean living room. Uh, not yet. Kids want milk and snack. Make sandwich. Mrs. wants glass of wine. Bring glass of wine. Not red, white. Bring white wine. Mr. wants whiskey. Bring whiskey. Not good for your stomach. They argue. Big day today. Vote day. Winner. Bad guy. 11 p.m. Put kids sleep. Mrs. and Mr. go bedrooms. Sex. Wash sheets tomorrow. No. Huh. They argue. <laughs> Vote no good. Midnight. They sleep. Clean downstairs. Living room. Kitchen. Sink. Mrs. always gets mad if the sink is dirty. Don't make noise. 1 a.m. Finish clean. Look, stickers. I voted. Oh, no. Color's dirty. I'm dirty. I want to take a bath. No, can't. They're here. I wash my armpits. I wash my neck. I wash my face. I wash my hands. I put my foot in the sink. Wash. <laughs> I put my other foot in the sink. Wash. Mrs. Always gets mad if the sink is dirty. <laughs> 2 a.m. Go sleep. Don't dream. Dream. Fresh air. Breathe. Breathe. Colors. <laughs> Butterflies. Birds. Beautiful flying creatures with sunflower hats and peacock feathers. Wash my feet. There are honeybees. They make a throne of petals, peppers, and honey for me. They bring a pillow. Nice colors. I voted. My honeybees vote for me. Work for me. Listen to me. Love me. I'm their queen as long as I live forever. Queen. Alarm. 5 a.m. Wake up. Call floor. Barefoot. Door squeaks. Quiet. No wake up, kids. Go kitchen. Clean sink. Mrs. Always gets mad if the sink is dirty. Mrs. Always gets mad if the sink is dirty. Mrs. Always gets mad if the sink is dirty. Sorry to have missed the meeting, Edna. It was unavoidable. But you came anyway. I am thrilled I get to have the formidable Mrs. Mary Church Terrell to myself. 
Dr. Brown is not home? Whenever the young women meet, he seems to have research in the school library. Oh, I should put this fabric away. I will finish the skirts after dinner. You will stay, won't you? I will. Thank you. Oh, such a fine silk wool. I did not realize you were a seamstress. I am not. But my mother taught me to sew, and her mother taught her. Father, however, insists I be an educator. Both are noble professions. Father says the path to progress lies in education. A modern man to have raised you as he might a son. Howard University and my mother have kept his mind open. But still, I think I frighten him. Nonsense! He was beaming when he told me you are class president, on track to become valedictorian. <laughs> I think that is the only reason he lets us have our sorority meetings here. What do you study? Languages, reason, history, and elocution. And what will you do after graduation? Um, teach, like you. I will hold our race to the highest standard of discourse and reason. To what end? Perhaps one day, one of my students will deliver an address to an august body as you have done, Mrs. Terrell. You mean the International Congress of Women? I read all about it in the Chicago Defender. A colored woman, born to former slaves, has visited Berlin, Paris. C'est incroyable. Who would believe it? May we? Oui. You could accomplish even more, Edna. Deliver a speech in German, English, and then French? I would be too nervous. But perhaps one day, one of my students will accomplish as much as you have. Oh, you dream on behalf of others. I admire that. Oh, I should help you put this fabric away. Tonight, I will make five more walking skirts for our women to wear in Monday's parade. Women's suffrage is not about proper walking skirts. The Deltas will not have attention averted by commentary on our shabby attire. Votes for women is too important. Colored women must be exemplary. And the gentlemen of Howard might find you becoming as well. The gentlemen of Howard found the sorority sisters of the AKA becoming. Lipstick and rouge was enough for them. The women of Delta Sigma Theta are more disciplined in our pursuits. I would not underestimate the leadership of the AKA. But you work to incorporate us. You supported our defection. Because I believe in your mission. I believe in your thirst for a more demonstrative action regarding social justice. But that does not mean the AKAs do not. If the AKAs believed in the active pursuit of equal justice, there would have been no need for the 22 of us to leave. Perhaps, but... Nellie Quander refused to hear our pleas. She refused to allow us to change the sorority name. Of course she would not surrender the name lightly. She wanted to protect it. There were no Negro Greek sororities before the AKAs, and they have flourished under Nellie Stewart's ship. But to try and prevent us from leaving. Oh, can you blame her? Nellie believes unity is necessary for progress. This is a new era. Besides, modern women do not need to be tied to men's fraternities. There was no template for any colored Greek association before Nellie Kwanda. Regardless, Delta Sigma Theta proudly stands independently. Oh, be that as it may. I believe respect is due for all that Nellie has accomplished. With all due respect, I am startled by your willingness to make accommodations to her. Why? She's a traitor. To whom? Twenty-two of you rose against her. With your help. Yes, and Nellie would be within her rights to consider us the traitors. But she has not lifted a finger to retaliate. Have you Delta spoken to her since you organized yourself? No. She is an appeaser, interested in social functions and... <laughs> Nellie Kwanda is not a vacuous socialite. And the AKAs are not frivolous. Nellie is one of the most educated Negro women in this country. And tradition means something to her. 
Nellie can trace her family back nearly 300 years. Very few Negroes can. That is merely her personal and fortunate history. No! That is legacy, association, influence. And aside from all of that, she is my friend. Your friend? But you helped us. On the way to the same destination, freedom and equality. I do not understand what you see in her. She is strong, intelligent, and shrewd. She has uncompromising principles, and she is tireless, much like you. But will she sew skirts for Monday's parade? No, she will not. But neither will you. What do you mean? I am sorry, Edna. I should have told you straight away, but your excitement was so... You are not marching in Monday's parade. Of course we are. We are awaiting permission from the procession's organizer. How long were you going to wait? Do none of you Deltas read a newspaper? This editor was told privately by the organizer of the Women's March for Votes that as far as she can see, there will be a white procession or a Negro procession, or no procession at all. I am sorry to bear disappointing news. No! We must march. We've been planning it for weeks. It's one of the reasons we left the AKAs in the first place, to, to march in this historic procession in front of the White House. I am sorry. So that's that. There will be no opportunity to demonstrate colored women's need for the vote. Certainly, you were aware that this was a possibility. We wrote our request weeks ago. We dared not assume a lack of response was due to prejudice. You should have heard the ladies tonight, still hopeful for a formal reply, soon enough for us to stitch up some skirts. None of us thought that a Quaker, a staunch abolitionist, would deny us. Why? Because you attend Howard University? Because you are all so accomplished? Because you are young and idealistic? Because it's not fair! <laughs> oh, child. <laughs> fair! Please do not mock me. It is true. You young women mounted a rebellion in the safe world of your Negro university. The parade for women's votes, however, takes place in the big, wide world. The world that bought and sold your grandmother, segregates your education, and denies you comfort daily. In that world, you have been denied. Everyone has been invited to participate, including men. We are women. Colored women. The colored women of Delta Sigma Theta. I can offer three things right now that may prove useful. One is from Corinthians. We are experiencing trouble on every side, but are not crushed. We are perplexed, but, but not, not driven, driven to, to despair. despair. We, we are, are persecuted, persecuted, but not abandoned. We are knocked down, but not destroyed. Oh! My father is the chair of the Department of Religion. The second thing? <laughs> It is from Tennessee, where I grew up. There is more than one way to skin a cat. I am hard pressed to see the value of a skinned cat. The third thing. Ugh, one of the girls must have forgotten her gloves. No, that will be the third thing. That will be Nellie Quander. Nellie Quander? Here? Why would she be here? Because I invited her. Oh, no! How can I possibly receive her a after what I've said, wh what we've done? I will wind the fabric. You admit your caller. Good evening, Miss Quander. I... Mary! Nellie! I am so glad you were able to call. Of course, and thank you, Edna, for receiving me. I... of course. Shall I get some tea? None for me, thank you. There is little time, and we should be about our business. Business? 
Yes, the business of you deltas marching in the women's suffrage parade. I had no idea you supported the procession. I personally have no desire to parade myself in public in front of a town full of drunken white men. It seems to me that Negro women have endured hundreds of years of such humiliating parading. This would be a parade of choice, not of chattel. Be that as it may, parading oneself is parading oneself. This procession is a demonstration of our discontent with exclusion. I am an educator, not an agitator. But I do understand and share your desire for enfranchisement. Then why do you scoff at our participation? There are other ways to demonstrate for the right of equality. What ways? Achievement, scholarship, model citizenship. And when that is not enough, excellence is always enough. Nevertheless, when I learned that Alice Paul preferred you deltas not be allowed to join the march, I took it upon myself to write her a letter. You knew she was denying us? Darling, everyone in town knew she was denying you. Why didn't you say anything? Well, you were so fired up, inspired, and you should be. I would not dare to throw cold water on your enthusiasm without a plan. You have a plan. Nellie has the plan. I wrote to Alice Paul over a week ago. Now you should know something about Miss Paul. She is always quick to return a letter, a day no longer than two. I wrote to her to inform her that a newly formed Greek society of Howard University was asking for formal permission to join the parade and explicit instructions on when and where they should organize themselves. After more than a week, I had still not heard from Miss Paul. I dislike her intensely. That is neither here nor there. A month ago, you disliked me intensely. Be that as it may, when a news editor released the contents of their private conversation, I knew what I must do. Warn us. Warn you? <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, what good would that do? No, I wrote to the National American Women's Suffrage Association to educate them about Miss Paul's position. You know people at NASA. Nelly knows everyone. More importantly, they know her. In any case, when the leadership got word that Alice Paul was discriminating against a colored sorority and that she'd been ignoring my request for your entry, they wired Ms. Paul and told her to answer my letter immediately. You did that for the Deltas. I did it for the race. In any case, an accusation of discrimination is hardly a distraction those women can afford. She suggested I call on her at the NASA offices. Did you? I didn't have the opportunity. As I neared the door, I could see Miss Paul with one of the women from a southern delegation. Those southern suffragettes would rather eat dirt than march beside colored women. Ignorance is never in short supply. In any case, I waited for her around the corner. When I got her attention... I suggested that if she'd rather not be seen in the company of a colored suffragette, then she should meet with us in a more discreet location. I gave her this address. She agreed to come here? How? I told her that a founding member of the NAACP and the National Association of Colored Women would be here waiting for her. That is why you called tonight, Mrs. Terrell. I am only sorry I missed seeing the rest of the Deltas, but I was with Nellie. Alice Paul is smart and shrewd, and she knows when it's wise not to refuse a meeting. What time is she to arrive? Half past the hour. That's now! She is organizing a parade to take place in two days with... Twenty-six floats, nine bands, four mounted brigades, three heralds with trumpets, and somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000 women. <sighs> she might be a little late. Then you must tell us everything you know about Miss Alice Paul. You've read everything. Oh, well, She has been in Washington, D.C. a year now. She has accomplished a lot. 
She was very active in England in their suffrage movement, and that's where she met her co-organizer for this march. Miss Paul has been jailed three times, forced to do hard labor, and is no stranger to the violence and abuse that women in this movement face. Violence? We could be attacked? Of course. And your skirts might get dirty. You are mocking me again. Power does not concede power easily, my dear. You must be willing to put your bodies in harm's way. Did you think that fighting for women's enfranchisement would be as easy as stitching up a few skirts? No, but I did not think... You will be spat upon and jeered at and face bodily harm. There will be no police who will protect you. Quite possibly they will lead the charge. So, if this is not something that you Deltas are willing to face, you should decide that, right now, and we can concede to Alice Paul so she can have her all-white procession. Miss Paul, it is an honor to meet you. Oh, Mary Church Terrell, the honor is mine. You presented besides Susan B. Anthony in Berlin. I was just a student when I read your speech. It was memorable. You are preparing an historic event. I appreciate your taking the time to meet. You do understand the symbolism of the event. I believe we do, but... We are marching the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration to make the statement that the issue of women's votes is alive before he takes office and will continue, if need be, long after he is gone. The women of Delta Sigma Theta sorority can stand behind that sentiment. Mm. Shall we not skirt the issue? Colored women will not march in the parade. <laughs> I appreciate your candor, but you are not asked here to give permission, only to grant your concession. I beg your pardon? The call was put out that all willing women's groups were invited. This march is not just spectacle. It is part of a long-term strategy to gain the vote. A federal amendment to the Constitution is your goal. Eventually, yes. I am guessing that if you get enough states to enfranchise women, then the federal government will be forced to recognize the validity of a woman's vote. That is right. But the states most likely to enfranchise women right now are in the South, where the white population is in jeopardy of being swamped. As it is, there are many former slaves outvoting the white population. So... You are allaying white Southern fears by assuring them that women's suffrage does not mean Negro women's suffrage. That is the only sound strategy. For you! But our goal is the full liberation of the Negro people, which cannot be attained unless the colored woman has a voice in the political process. I'm afraid that votes for Negro women diffuses our argument. Nonsense! It conflates women's suffrage with a stand against segregation and a fight for racial equality. The two must be considered separately. The unequal treatment of one group compromises the status of all others. But southern states are willing to revoke the rights of white women in order to preserve white sovereignty. Then why not choose unity and make the suffrage of all women your position? It is too risky. Wait until white women get the vote, then ask for yours. White women only suffrage would be the nail in the coffin of black freedom. It is justice delayed, not denied. It is a vote for white supremacy. We cannot support that. You want too much too soon. So, we are to watch as white women climb the ladder of enfranchisement, then pull that ladder up behind them, just as colored women grab a rung? Why have you so little faith that we'll fight for you? Because the Negro race has suffered more from the antipathy and narrowness of white women both North and South than from any other single source. <gasps> that is intolerably prejudiced. I have no antipathy toward your kind. Or so you believe. I am a Quaker. 
and we fought diligently for the abolition of slavery. Commendable. But slavery's abolition was not the end of injustice. It was a step in the right direction. As are laws against flogging wives. But the cessation of beating does not make a happy marriage. We insist that this country live up to its own ideals. We cannot allow you to sacrifice colored women on the altar of white women's primacy. What do you plan to do? We have organized ourselves and made our banner. Edna is making walking skirts for our women. You would march uninvited? Unwanted? Oh, of course not. You will invite us. <laughs> Are you unaware of the sentiment toward the Negro in Washington, D.C. at the moment? We are living in colored women's bodies. How could we not be aware? A woman was defiled on Christmas Eve by a Negro man. A white woman. So she claims. But we've heard many such claims in our lifetimes. Do you believe her? It doesn't matter what I believe. Public sentiment is against you. There are Southern women from every former slave state descending on the city for this march. Women whose loyalty will be tested by the presence of Negroes. We do well with tests. Women have made pilgrimages from as far away as New York City to line up behind Inez Milholland. She will be wearing a white gown and riding a white horse. It will be a sight to behold. It was planned to be an arresting vision. And when we lay our brown bodies down on the street before that white horse, daring her to ride forward over us, the spectacle will be even greater. You would not. A newly formed colored Greek sorority in their freshly made silk wool skirts, sacrificing themselves to the goddess in white, a march within a march, a protest within a protest. You are not going about this in the right way. If you were afraid that our quiet presence in your parade would offend your southern suffragettes, Imagine what effect 22 colored women lying in the streets in front of Miss Milholland will have. The papers will photograph it. The editors will write about it. The sensibilities of those delicate southern suffragettes will be offended. They will get the vapors. Not just because we walk shoulder to shoulder with them, but because we will be the center of attention. Those white male editors will write about us. <laughs> I am from Tennessee, and believe me, there is nothing a southern white woman hates more than the attention given to colored women by white men. We need those women. We need them to tip the balance and force the issue. You would ruin years of planning? Years of hard work? Years of strategy? That responsibility is yours alone. You have decided this parade is essential to propel you toward your goal, and yet you would deny colored women what you want for yourself. That paradox will be your ruination. There's a problem with your fantasy. No newspaper in this country would print the story as you have just described it. White editors may not listen to us, but they certainly listen to the Chicago Defender, the Richmond Planet, the Pittsburgh Courier, and when our colored editors write about the colored women who lay prone in the streets of Washington, D.C., when they write that the colored women are simply asking the deeply prejudiced suffragettes to look within their own hearts, to behold the oppression they perpetuate even as they seek the vote for themselves, when our newspapers are outraged at your double standard. <laughs> the Washington Times will surely be interested. <laughs> I have read Miss Paul. 
that you stood before the Minister of Foreign Affairs in London at a cabinet meeting and told him these are all wonderful ideas, but couldn't you extend them to women? Whereupon the constables dragged you away through the streets. Now, what makes you think that colored women who have been beaten and enslaved, slighted and deprived of their dignity and human rights, are willing to do less? <sighs> white women first. The artists in white, office workers in blue, homemakers in brown, then the men, then the colored women. Oh, it is generous of you to extend the invitation. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to meet you, Miss Paul. You are a fortunate woman. You have indomitable mentors. Yes, I see that. Have your deltas there at half past nine, Pennsylvania Avenue. I will. And that, I think, is all there is to discuss. I owe you an apology. Oh, you owe me nothing. But I do. I have studied and read, but still I did not... I underestimated you. I said some terrible things. We were all so young once. I was simply paying my own debt. I do not understand. There are Negro women who came before us, Edna, who in their own way, small or bold frightened or fierce, educated or coarse, did their best on behalf of those who came after. They are unsung, but they did their best. I have merely done my best, Edna. My best by the AKAs, by the Deltas, and by my own conscience. You must always do your best, even if you falter, do your best. Nellie Quanda, you are keeper of the flame. Mary Church Terrell, you are the flame itself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Edna Brown, I think you have some walking skirts to make. <laughs> <laughs> First time my mother brought me into a voting booth, I was about seven years old. She cried. Voting makes me cry sometimes. Sometimes, all the time, every single time. I bring tissues now. I was working three jobs, didn't have a sitter. The people at the polling place could see how frazzled I was. They said I could take her in with me. I was pretty excited. All those levers and names. I knew voting was important. We had voted at school for which books we liked, who got to read out loud that day. I felt pretty grown up. But when we got in there and she pulled the curtain closed, she didn't click any of the levers down. At least not right away. Her eyes were misting up and, well, there she went. In the booth, I looked down at her precious little face and... It took me right back. That's another thing my mother does. She gets taken back. There is nothing wrong with letting history move you. It does move me. I just don't have as much history as you. That's what you think. You want me to tell the story? Anyway, we're in the voting booth. 
and I'm looking at her face, and I see myself in it. Then I see my own mother, and her mother, too. The only thing I pray for now is that somebody tells the children what happened. Because they gotta tell their own. You don't pass it on. People forget. My mother was a teacher right there on the south side of Chicago. Up south, they called it. That's right. Up south, because everybody had come up from down south. Kentucky, Mississippi, Alabama, and most everybody still had family down there. With so many people going up north, it's a wonder anybody was around to bear witness. One July day in 1963, when I was seven years old, the same age as you were that day I took you into the booth, my mother rounded up all the children on our block to make art projects. On summer vacation? Oh, that's what we said. But my mother insisted we'd feel good about it when we were done. Ugh. We made macaroni jewelry boxes, rag bag pictures, oil paintings, every kind of art or craft she could think of. Four weeks later, we displayed all our wares in our backyard. Tempera paintings and rag bag pictures hung on our garage door gallery. All the craft boxes and handiwork lined cloth-covered tables. Everything was for sale. Generous neighbors bought every last work of art we had made. So she was teaching you about enterprise. She was teaching us activism. She called us the KPs, Kids for Progress. You were seven. That's right. And in that crystal blue summer of 1963, the KP sent $43.65 to the Alabama Freedom Fund. $43? About 400 bucks today. Wow. Mom told me that story right there in the voting booth. How she and a ragtag bunch of third grade artists sold our goods and raised money for the folks in Birmingham, Alabama who were trying to vote. Good thing there was nobody behind us waiting. People forget, but voter registration was as big a part of the freedom movement as desegregation. Our people wanted to vote even more than they needed to sit at an integrated lunch counter. They hadn't had a voice in nearly a hundred years since Reconstruction. Well, somebody organized this Freedom Fund. They collected money from everywhere, and folks used it to organize us. It takes a lot of community organizing to demand your rights from people who'd rather not give them to you. Of course, I had no idea what the Alabama Freedom Fund was. I hardly had any idea where Alabama was, but I knew better than to ask my mother when she was being taken back. We'd seen the news footage from Birmingham early that May. Youngsters sliding across slick streets flooded by Bull Connor's hoses. Attack dogs ripping at their clothes and skin. We'd sat in front of the TV, horrified. Our families had all fled that place. These were the relatives we'd left behind, and they were being tortured. They called us the Children's Crusade, and a lot of people didn't like the idea of kids on the front lines, but we felt like we had to demonstrate. Dr. King had been put in jail. The movement was running out of bodies because, honestly, the grown-ups were becoming leery of being arrested. There was nobody left to count on but the young people, so... About 500 of us left school to go downtown and demonstrate. That day in the voting booth, my mother said to me, We're counting on you, sweetie. You are the future. What did that mean? I don't think she knew what I meant. Bless her heart. To tell you the truth, I didn't really know we were going to encounter all that hate. And I sure didn't know what all that violence was going to lead to. My mother told me that people had fought long and hard for the right to stand in front of a list of names and pull the lever. I'd watched my parents line up to vote for years, never once getting to mark their X on a ballot. The Bull Connors of the world had told them they had to pay a tax before they'd be allowed to vote. But how were they going to pay a tax when they had to take off the whole day just to get to the polling place? Then they told them they needed to know how to read and write before they could vote. But how could they learn to read and write if they couldn't vote to change the laws that said they didn't have a right to an education? Education. 
I loved school, so at that point I really started listening. I told my baby that this was a special day, getting to stand there together, about to cast a vote. And now, a dozen years later, here I stand, about to cast my first vote. It wasn't until five years after Bull Connor's dogs that I actually got to vote. By that time, my parents had gotten tired. Tired of marching, tired of fighting, tired of being beaten down. Every time I stand in front of a voting booth, I wish my parents were alive to see it. She said it again. You children are the future. But the children weren't tired. We got knocked down by hoses and chewed on by dogs, but we kept standing up. And finally, one year after that year of the dogs, Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act with Martin Luther King standing right over his shoulder. I get misty thinking about it. I get misty thinking about it. I tease her, but I get kind of misty thinking about all that it took for me to stand here today. In Alabama. In Chicago. In New York. Pulling the lever. Pulling the lever. Pulling the lever. 2017, I found myself a Fulton County voter, challenging the legality of my state and county for beginning the process of illegally targeting myself, three of my adult children, and over 380,000 voters in one action in one year. We were part of the 1.4 million Georgia voters that were removed since 2012. Um, it put in me a desire and motivation to stand up and fight back against what can only be called this massive and systemic voter disenfranchisement that has gone on virtually unchecked. From the days of Reconstruction and Jim Crow to the erosion of the Voting Rights Act by the Supreme Court in its Holder versus Shelby decision. Hello, I'm Meseret Stroman-Wheeler from Black Women in the Ballot. I truly hope you enjoyed the show. Hi, I'm Celestine Ray. Hi guys, this is Gabrielle Archer. Hello, I'm Lynette R. Freeman, and I was in Don't Dream. Hi, I'm Montana Lambert Hoover. Let me ask you a question. Are you registered to vote? If you are, great. If not, please register. Hello, I'm Felicia Rashad, and I am encouraging you, I am urging you to register to vote and to vote. Make your voice heard. Please, please vote in 2020. Vote if you can't protest. Vote if you can't donate. Vote if you can do both of those things. As we are bearing witness to protests in our country right now and all over the world, we must be reminded of those who came before us, who put their lives on the line to make sure that we had the right to vote. Do it on a local level, because that's who is going to make the biggest difference in your community. Many times you're voting for not just the presidential candidates, but also local and state government, where it is essential for there to be someone in office who will listen to organizers and listen to their constituents. Voting is a privilege. It is a right and it is our responsibility as citizens. Vote. Hi. We really hope that you enjoyed those three radio plays. I love listening to plays and the one Silver lining in this crazy, cloudy time is that we get to do that again. And um, so, what a blessing. We're going to start our panel discussion in just a moment. Tweet your comments and your questions um, now and as we uh, have the panel discussion, as we talk with the panelists, and um, we'll answer as many as we can. So, meet you right back here in just a couple of minutes.
Thank you. That was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I have to say, you know, I got my start in uh, radio dramas at uh, WGBH in Boston. So it's great to see the resurgence of the radio drama. <laughs> I am going to ask you to start by uh, once again introducing yourselves and the role you played in this. So I'll start with Judy. Hi, I'm Judy Tate. I am the producing artistic director of the American Slavery Project, and I wrote In the Parlor and Pulling the Lever. Oh, and I directed the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Lynette R. Freeman, and I was in Don't Dream. I am Mesred Stroman Wheeler. I serve as associate producer for American Slavery Project, and I was in In the Parlor as Mary Church Terrell and Pulling the Lever as Woman Two. Hi, I'm Celestine Ray. I was in In the Parlor, and I played Nellie Quander. Hi, I am Valencia Yearwood. I am also an actress who didn't have the wonderful experience of uh, participating this evening, but I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I am a past uh, chair of the Eastern Region Arts and Letters Committee for Delta. Thank you. Um, Judy, I'd like to start with you. I've known you for a really long time. When we first met, you were an actor turned playwright and um, over the years have amassed quite a few uh, Emmys for your writing on television. Um, and I know you alluded to it a little bit at the beginning, but could you please give a, 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 a better idea of what the impetus was for starting American Slavery Project? Yeah, it was the, as I said, it was the, the 150th uh, anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War. And I was appalled because people were throwing um, sesquicentennial Confederate balls. They were having um, installations of Jefferson Davis as the president of the Confederacy. They were flying Confederate flags over Capitol buildings. And then they read the Constitution in um, the Senate and redacted any mention of enslavement. And I was just too through. And at the same time, there were um, three main stage productions about this era um, in New York, and none of them were written by African American writers. And I knew too many really wonderful African American writers who had plays taking place, through, you know, in that era, and um, including me. Uh, so. I put out a call to action, and Keith Joseph Atkins and Godfrey Simmons, two of our partners uh, on this today, answered the call, and we had a reading series of plays from this era, from, from Black History Month through Juneteenth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mesorat, I know there's been a lot of talk about it lately, but just in case there are still people who, are, who don't know what Juneteenth is, would you explain it for everyone? Yes, yeah, so Juneteenth is the celebration of the end of slavery. So what happened was uh, initially it was recognized as January 1st and largely about informing uh, those who had been enslaved about voting. And we really thought that this would be perfect to do black women in the ballot uh, uh, on Juneteenth, the day that uh, we're recognizing and celebrating freedom from, from being enslaved. And what people don't or maybe do or don't know, you know, Judy and I had talked about, we didn't really know this growing up, but people in Texas knew about it because that's where it happened, uh, that they were two and a half years out from slavery and didn't know or when they found out. Um, and initially, like I said, it, it was about informing them about the right to vote. And um, with doing this, we're celebrating our black women and the right to vote and our strides that we have made and what we have done in order to push the uh, right to vote forward. You know, it's interesting. You think that it took two and a half years for the word to get out that you are free and it brings to mind what they say in the play about no one willingly gives up power. So something to think about. Um, Lynette, you know, I'm, I'm really struck by the piece that you did, which is a, you know, 
I, what, what really strikes me about it is the uh, entitlement that we get to witness through your observation. Um, if you could speak a little bit to what it was like to do that piece and, and, and bringing that out as one person. Um, it was a it was a wonderful experience because like as a storyteller, basically it's about um, showing what it means to be human. And so it's almost like um, I was able to invite the audience into this woman's experience in order to understand uh, that this uh, modern day slavery for many folks who are undocumented still goes on. Um, it's interesting, uh, uh, my uh, family, half my family is from the Caribbean and half my family is from the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, part of my side hustles at times has been as a babysitter, but it's really amazing to look at that world um, because I would be encountering many nannies um, many of whom were women of color who, you know, the kids could talk to them any particular way, like that kind of source of like entitlement that sort of existed um, and had uh, several, um, several encounters myself where the expectation was more than just I'm going to, you know, take care of your children for a given amount of time. It was I'm going to clean your house and cook your food and all of these different things. Um, that wasn't previously agreed upon. And um, it's something that we all have to look at and reckon with and also understand that uh, many women of color and specifically black women have in order to uh, support uh, many white women in their suffrages uh, while they were going to meetings, while they were going to protests and demonstrations, we were the ones actually stepping in to fill that gap and take care of the children and take care of the house. And so therefore, um, and often we don't get recognized for that. Um, so I think it was uh, allowing us a look into um, what the expectation uh, that privilege sometimes affords folks, even citizenship privilege <laughs> that we don't often think about. Yeah, uh, those who have the right to vote and have the privilege and, and, and how complacent we are and not realizing how much other people wish they had the privileges. And yet, oftentimes, those of us who are privileged, those who, you know, are um, the least happy with what they know. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, we have a comment here from Mark Wojcik. Uh, being invited to march but being placed last must have been a bittersweet victory. As a dramatist, was the author conflicted as to how to write the ending? Um, that's, you know, no, um, I think that Mary Church Terrell set out to, um, get Alice Paul to acquiesce. And one of the things that, th that's really important to understand about, you know, this was 1913, <laughs> this was 1913 and they needed to march. So whether they were last or whether they were in the middle, they were happy to be marching. And you, you know, when you go toe to toe, head to head with somebody, you've got to allow them to win a little, do you know? I mean, that's, that's, you know, a, a principle of compromise. And, you know, I know today compromise is a really, really bad word, but in the minds of these strategists, right? The strategy was to be there, be involved. You may start at the back, but you're going to end up in the front. <laughs> you know, and to, you know, you got to be, you got to be in the parade to move up. Great, um, Valencia. I'm going to admit, you know, I, I've never been a joiner in my life, and so I truly did not 
get the whole sorority thing when I was in college, but I have learned later in life to understand the good work that they do. Um, and can you, the, the, the play told us a little bit about the beginnings of their work, but can you tell us in our time today, the kind of work that sororities do? Absolutely. Um, you know, if you speak to any Delta, they will tell you that, yes, it's a sorority, it's about the sisterhood, but at the end of the day, we are a public service organization. Um, our first public act as a sorority was the March uh, for Women's Suffrage, and so political activism is in our DNA. And there has been some talk over the last few years about the, the relevance of Greek letter organizations, right? And so Delta is just one of nine Greek letter organizations. There are four uh, black Greek letter organiz uh, sororities and five fraternities. Um, and what we have realized over the last few years is that we are all doing the same work. We're just doing it, you know, under different letters, under different colors, but we are all doing the same work. And so for Delta specifically, um, we operate on a five point thrust. And what that is, is economic development, uh, educational development, political awareness, international awareness, and physical and mental health. So we are 300,000 women strong uh, internationally. Uh, we are the largest women, African-American women's organization. And, you know, our work is in the community. That is what we do. Uh, we have partnerships with so many different other organizations. We have a partnership with Habitat for Humanity. We have um, three mentoring programs for young women and men. Um, every year we do what we call, we, we hold what we call uh, Delta Days in the nation's capital and Delta Days at uh, the UN. And uh, we descend on those, those spaces and we engage with politicians and world leaders to let them know that, you know, we are here and we are working in our community. Um, as a matter of fact, Loretta Lynch, who is a Delta, um, if you remember when she was first um, nominated to be Attorney General, uh, the Senate dragged their feet on her confirmation. Well, there was a call put out um, amongst Delta Sigma Theta, and we descended, we literally descended on Capitol Hill in our fabulous red and, um, and we let the Senate know that we expect her to be confirmed. And that's exactly what happened. So that's the kind of work um, that we do. And there's a lot of um, famous Delta, there's a lot of famous AKs as, you know, Men of Alpha and Omega Sci-Fi, and you know, that are world leaders that got their start in terms of um, social action in these organizations. Wow, powerful. Thank you very much. Um, Celestine, uh, Mary Church Terrell and Nellie Quander don't really get the same kind of notoriety as their white counterparts. I'm curious to know how much you knew about them prior to doing the show, and what, if anything new, did you learn about them in taking on your role? Um. Unfortunately, I did not know a lot about either women. Um, I knew a little bit about Nellie Quander, um, only that she was affiliated with the AKAs, but I didn't know in what capacity, to what capacity. Um, that was not a part of my formal education. Um, even when I got to college and I was actively taking African American studies courses, most of the women or most of the figureheads that I was learning about were men. They weren't. They were not women. Um, they were not black women. So I was learning um, about different movements, but the leadership that black women were showing was not a part of my education. And I had to actively begin to seek that out. Um, and I have to continue to seek that out. So being a part of this play, I really learned how much these women were, as Judy said earlier, strategists. They were really making strategic moves to make sure that 
equality was a part of the Black experience for all Black people, not just men, not just women, but for all Black people. And they understood the importance of Black women's right to vote um, as being part of Black people's liberation. Um, and so I learned about the ways that, you know, Nellie Quander, her, her way of doing things was not necessarily Edna Brown's way of doing things, but she worked collectively with other Black women for a larger cause. And so that really inspired me to learn that about the way that she was working with other people in, in, in ways that did kind of clash with her actual way of uh, achieving uh, freedom. Uh, if I can just, if, do you know the Quander family? Hello, Quanders, if you're out there. <laughs> there is still a big family in D.C. And um, if anybody knows any of those Quanders, please turn them on to this. I, I would love to get to know them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's another thing that I loved about the play is it showed you that, you know, a lot of people think that it was slavery and then it was the Huxtables. And it, <laughs> well, but I mean, a lot of people, yeah. when they think of, you know, black people, they only think of slavery in our past. And whether it's Black Wall Street, which was, you know, bombed, but, but that, that yeah. blacks had their own communities and they were wealthy and they were educated. So it's important to know that history as well. Yes, that was one of the things that really fascinated me about these women when I started digging into it. You know, I didn't know this history. Um, I'm neither an AKA or a Delta, so I didn't have a, a pony in the race. <laughs> um, but but you're, you're, you're absolutely right. There is, there is um, you know, I love when Nellie says, um, do your best. Yeah. Um, I, that's what we're trying to do, you know, and it, 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 it is a continuum. And that's why when I say that we're a theatrical response to revisionism, that's really a lot of what I'm talking about, Melissa. That is, you know, in slavery didn't end, it evolved, you know, it, it became Jim Crow, you know, where anything a black person could, you know, did could be demonized and made illegal so that they could work for free by being, you know, um, incarcerated. Every single thing is predicated on the thing before. So that's, and so we try to make connections between today and this early history. So when people talk about um, a lack of education, you know, there were, you, you know, there, there were people, there were women, Mary Church Terrell, she did that speech in French and German and English, right? <laughs> she was out there. She was doing that. And I, I just love these women's fight for their own education, having seen their parents not have anything for these people to, you know, these women to, you know, claw their way so that they could be someone in the black community who teaches the rest of everybody. You know, it's like we have this thing in our in our community. And that's like, come on, everybody. We're bringing you along, <laughs> you know? And at least that's the value that I grew up with. You know, if you're more fortunate, you know, like, like the young one says, that's her fortunate history. <laughs> and, and, you know, Mary Church Terrell is telling her, well, it's yours too, because she happens to be known in this city and people listen to her. So you're not known, she is, she's gonna help you, <laughs> you know? And I think that's what, you know, we gotta help each other. Another line I was struck by is, I'm an educator, not an agitator. And, and I would argue, you know, you gotta be both. <laughs> <laughs> Progress comes from both, you know? Yes, it does. And, you know, it's interesting because I think that I, I, I wrote her like that so that we could see how we've come. I do believe in doing my best, right? But I think Nellie is wrong in that she thinks that that's going to be enough. And, you know, we know today in 2020 that it's not enough. You can be your best and you still, you got to be better than your best. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
And so, you know, I really wanted people to understand, you know, the evolution of these ideas. Can I just... Hold on a second. We just, we, but just, yes. Uh, I just want to remind people, because we only have a few more minutes, so if you have anything to ask, be sure to tweet it at amslaveryproj. A-M-S-L-A-V-E-R-Y-P-R-O-J. Thank you. Go ahead, Valencia. I just actually uh, want to address um, the first question that someone asked about, you know, whether or not we felt like it was a slight that we were last. Um, I cannot tell you how proud we are as Deltas to have been able to do that. And the fact that that was our first public act. Um, Shirley Chisholm, who also was a Delta, um, said that, you know, if they don't give you a seat at the table, you bring your own chair. And that's what we did. We brought our own chair. So, you know, you have to be in the game in order before you can change the rules. And so if that was the only way to get in, we are immensely proud of that act. Thank you. Immense. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Know, um, I, I want to talk a little bit, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? Okay. I wanted to, you, you, you mentioned the Chicago Defender, and I know your father was, uh, worked there? Yeah, <laughs> so my father worked at the Defender. I think it's really important to talk about the press, give, especially in today's time, uh, and how important they are to change and movement. Yeah, yeah, especially, well, all the time, you know, for every paper that the Chicago Defender sold, 10 or 15 other people got to read it. You know, my dad started out as the circulation manager, so I'm sort of interested in that. And then he became the general manager my entire growing up. But I think it's really important now to, you know, to have a respect for journalism. Um, when I saw journalists being arrested recently, I, 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 I couldn't believe it. Um, I think it's important for people to understand the difference between journalism and social media, although Celestine did say something the other day that was really cool about the intersection of journalism and, you know, and, uh, and, and social media. But I think it's important to have an understanding and respect for what true journalism is and that anything you slap on TV or you slap on a web page is does not have journalistic integrity, right? But and so Steve. <laughs> well, no, I, the other day I was saying that social media has had such a huge influence on our media and journalism and how we are now having to become social media literate so that we can disseminate what is fact and what is fiction, but the power of having cameras in our own phones and recording things. Um, I don't know if we would have known about the death of George Floyd if someone hadn't recorded it. And so because of that, and because social media is now so much a part of our lives, the news media now is picking it up and, and sharing it. And so we're, we're aware of things that are happening in real time in a way that maybe we weren't before. And I think that, you know, the, you know, the, well, people say it disparagingly, the mainstream media, but, you know, the, you know, the newspapers and um, I, I read a lot, so, you know, I'm a newspaper person. Um, but I think you're right, Celestine. I think it's totally changed how they actually respond to events, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. their theatrical response. And they, they have responded to the people's, the citizen journalist. Do you know, the citizen journalist. And I believe it, it brings the citizen journalist to call the media to task because yeah. it, it, it is no longer a free media. Um, in many cases, media um, is uh, owned or uh, money is given Corporate. by these corporations and lobbyists to said media to skew certain stories, to print certain stories and not other stories, to paint things in a certain light, to lose, you know, certain goings on. And so I think that now 
what Celestine is saying is true. It's like now people have their phones and also have blogs and um, are also approaching with journalistic integrity and vigor, um, also uh, connected to many social movements and calling a lot of media to task yeah, how they are reporting certain things yeah. and how they may be um, making certain things very mainstream when they ought not, you know, when they should be calling BS on certain things. And I, 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 will, I will give an example of that. I don't know how many people know this, but in the last three or four weeks, there have been at least six black people who have been found hanging from trees across the country. I only know about that because of social media, mm. not really hearing it in the news. So uh, uh, to your point, and, and, and why is it not a top story? So, you know, that's, that's something to think about. Um, we have a comment here from Gabra Zachman. Uh, there's such a division between white and black women in the women's movement still today. I'm wondering if this is where that division began or before. I've always wondered where and when this began. Anyone want to? Well, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I, we weren't there. I don't know. But I, you know, I, I, you know um, I think this is uh, seminal in terms of the women's movement, but the division between white women and black women did not begin with suffragettes, obviously. Um, white women who were um, in uh, um, states, slave states, you know, the southern states, uh, found that owning people was the and, and running a household was their primary source of power, you know? And so, you know, when... Um, you know, when it came to abolition, you know, many white women were, you know, many white women like Alice Paul were certainly abolitionists, but many did not want to give up their only source of power, you know, the power to, you know, because they didn't have money, they didn't have anything of their own, they were treated basically as chattel, and so women that were treated as chattel could treat somebody else, there could be somebody else lower than them, Great, you know, that's how power works, you know. So I think, you know, those divisions were sown as soon as the first African enslaved person stepped off a ship. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I, I have to ask now about, you know, with the protesting going on, it shows that people want change. So what do we say to the people who still think that their vote doesn't matter. I would have to say you ch you change the structure across like do, do a scorched earth campaign in that it's not just about say like the presidential election. What we found like in, in terms of like for instance the primaries, you're not just voting for a primary candidate, you're also voting for your local government, your state government. And so when we're here talking about um, with, a, with a lot of the um, a lot of the protests like defund the uh, police departments and all of, the, all of these different things, these, these social movements that are very much grassroots and about local, you voting in your local um, in your local ed elections and also being aware of what's happening in terms of what's happening in your city. Where is the money being allocated? Are you voting for money being taken from schools? And also on top of it, who is your your district attorney? Um, understanding that your all of your taxpayer money are going to these people's salaries. So why not? A, becoming, become more engaged and knowledgeable as to who is stepping into those positions, raising hell if you look at what their, their platforms are and they do not align with what you know morally to be good. Um, 
giving to someone else's campaign and also um, being able to vote for someone else. And also uh, on top of that, it doesn't just stop in the voting booth. Afterwards, then it is holding our um, public officials accountable for what they say they are going to do or any type of change that we want to see. Because it's like, no, I voted for you. And guess what? You need, you now need to move in these particular ways and raise hell until they do. And so it's like, we want to create movements in the streets because that has gotten a lot of, um, a lot of things changed in a quick amount of time, but also doing it in the voting booth, doing it, you know, in the courts because, and then also getting people um, locally involved in elections, you know, even for city council and things like that, who live in the neighborhoods that we're talking about. Um, people that you know can actually run for election, can be up for election for different things. Yeah. And so, yeah. I, I would just add to that, you know, people tend to think when they think of the government, they think of it as some other separate entity and they give it this hierarchy that it doesn't deserve. We are the government. The government is made up of all of us and those in government work for us. They are our employees and somehow people don't remember that. So we must hold them accountable. Uh, we have uh, a comment here from Ms. Payne, MVCS. Thank you so much for this. I saw in the parlor live last summer, thank you, Ms. Payne, um, the black newspapers you mentioned in the play, were you able to use actual articles that they reported for research? Yes, <laughs> I did. And in, um, uh, I, I read a lot of articles and um, the article that she quotes, it's not from a black newspaper, but that's a real article. Um, you know, uh, Alice Paul actually did say there will be a white parade or a black parade or no parade at all. And uh, you have to understand that when they asked me, I, I was commissioned to write a suffrage play. I was like, well, where are the black women? I know we had to be there. I know, you know, so I went to, you know, a lot of the newspapers and I just, um, and I, and I, you know, I can go down the rabbit hole street. <laughs> I got a, I got a lot of wonderful information from from our newspapers. Do you know? For those who don't know Judy Tate, she is the queen of research. <laughs> <laughs> um, One of the things can I say with the research, we had found a letter. You know, you talk about the sisterhood of these women. Although I'm an AKA beta alpha chapter, sure. <laughs> go Rattlers. Um, I'm to you. Oh. I'm to you. <laughs> um, but we see the sisterhood between these women and how they were really fighting to help each other and to help lift the race, which is one of the lines that Celestine Ray had. Nellie Quander actually wrote a letter to Alice Paul on behalf of the Deltas trying to help these young women become a part of the parade. You know, and I think that- You found that, right? You right, found, found that letter. Yeah, yeah, we found that letter. Um, but one of the things I was thinking is these women fought so hard. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that their parents were enslaved, right? So you had these women who were now, they were able to read, they are able to write, able to be free. And it was all about lifting the race up together. It was all about helping each other out. That's one of the things I just like love so much about this play. And I think we all get so teary at the end because we feel that, you know, our ancestors, those who've come before us, like fought so hard for us to be able to have what we have and the rights that we have and to be able to do the things that we're able to do. So thank you, Judy, <laughs> for shining up these black women. Um, <laughs> if I can just take that to today, it's one of the things that makes me so hopeful about what I'm seeing right now because there's something about the quarantine who is, that's made the world suddenly realize we are all in this together. 
And so it's great to see people of all different races and cultures coming together, you know, as one and saying, this is our problem, not just yours, it's our issue. Yeah, there are people all over the world marching. Yes, yeah. um, in, in, in this movement, you know, um, this is the most multicultural um, Black Lives Matter moment I've ever seen. And I just am floored. You know, my mother used to sit around like in 1968. Those young people, I love them. They got the right thing. It's all about love. You know, because it was about you know, love, right? And, and, and justice. And, they're, and I'm feeling the same way. Look at those young people out there. They, you know, they're marching when I can't because, I, because, because I'm type A blood. <laughs> no, but I'm just so proud of everybody. Yeah. And so when you talk about everyone okay. who's coming out. What's that? I was going to say, when you talk about the continuum, Judy, I, I'm thinking about Edna Brown in the play and how she's like, we must march. We have to be out there. And how Nellie Quander, who's a little bit of an older generation, is like, that's you need to be educated. And like, that's her way. But it's always the young people that are pushing things forward. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that young people, where they start out, like you were saying, Meseret, you know, if, if, if you start, wherever you start out in the movement is going to inform you. So our young people now, some of them grew up with a black president, like that was just regular. For a lot of us, we were like, I don't know if I'm gonna ever see it in, our, in my lifetime. So to start out there and then to have a totally drastic switch with this current um, administration, they're like, enough is enough, we're out in these streets. And so that it's really inspiring to see the continuum it, and it's in the play and you see it right now in the world everywhere. Yes, hundreds of thousands of Edna Brown. <laughs> we, have, we, we have another comment from at Jane Beth S. If a domestic worker is undocumented, they can be forced to be work, uh, work long hours. I can't believe I never realized that before and I am ashamed. Wow. I think I think it's one of those things that it's like we don't think to ourselves like um, many uh, many folks who are undocumented what they are able to actually do <laughs> you know because the the um, the risk is so high especially with this administration which actually has absolutely no wiggle room or tolerance, but actually before this administration, and this is also another thing about, you know, becoming a lot more civically, everyone, all Americans need to be a lot more civically um, sound and educated, is that like administrations ago, we voted on a lot of these immigration laws that uh, put a lot of undocumented workers in danger. If they say something, who are they going to go to? because they risk being deported if they say, you know, and, 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 you know, especially when we know that there's a difference in, in how we deal with wealth in this country, someone who has more money versus someone who doesn't, even if they're both Americans. And it's um, not like they can just go out and get another job tomorrow. Exactly. And, and, and on behalf of Saviana, Saviana, hello, who wrote that beautiful, beautiful piece? That was based on a real person. That wasn't, you know, she just didn't make that up out of her head. I mean, well, she did, but she didn't. You know what I mean? Um, she's, you know, she's, she's the real deal. And that was a real human being that, you know, she she wanted to honor. And one thing I did want to say back to Celestine's point about the young people now. I think that also the movement is so great because also the young people. Uh, understand um, the, you know, it's not just one behind one leader or one way of doing things. Now it seems like it's, it's dispersed. It's everywhere. There's no centralized BLM building, you know, <laughs> that can be conveniently bombed or one, <laughs> one person that can be taken out. It is now like people who are working in tech, there are people on the streets, there are people who are healers, there are people who are, you know, an encouragement of everyone to get in where they fit in, and um, all moving towards the same direction. So I think that that's, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, I'm going to wrap this up, and i got two more questions. But before I do, I just want to remind people that if you missed some of this or if you loved it enough that you just want to watch it again, um, then you can stream the production of Black Women in the, uh, and the Ballot, including this Q&A, um, on your YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel, uh, for a limited time once this stream ends. So be sure to go back on, tell your friends that they can see it, anybody who missed it, but it'll be on for a, a short time. Um, just two more questions. Um, you know, people talked about how much they learned and, you know, one of the reasons that I got involved with the American Slavery Project years ago is because, you know, I'm old school and I believe that theater should do more than just entertain, you know, from the days of the Greeks, it should inform, it should teach, it should challenge. Uh, and, and so with American Slavery Project, you're always going to have that growth. Uh, what can people do to stay involved? Uh, to learn more about S ASP, and especially if they'd like to support ASP? Well, they can go to our website, and they can sign up for the mailing list. There is a place on the website they can sign up for the mailing list. Um, this show will be up on YouTube uh, until June 30th. Um, I do want to thank all of our partners down below this window. <laughs> if you came to the show through one of them, please go to their website and donate. And if you came through the American Slavery Project, there's a gigantic donation button on every page. <laughs> you can donate. Um, and I want to thank the people who have been donating um, as we've, you know, put our e-blasts out. We could not do that. We are tiny. We could not do this work without you. Um, people would be appalled at how, on how little we work with. But <laughs> you know, you know, when you get when you have limits, you got to make it anyway. <laughs> so that's what we do. And yeah. what is the most important thing people can do? Donate. Well, I was going to say vote. Oh, vote. 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 <laughs> vote. Oh yeah, you got to vote. But I, but but I. <laughs> because I don't know, for anybody who's watching who's in New York, it's Tuesday, the 23rd is primary day, and primary is just as important as the big vote in November. Absolutely. Start Tuesday. And if you don't live in New York, if you're, you know, visiting us from somewhere else tonight, find out when your primary is, if it hasn't already happened. And vote for your primary. Research your, um, your state. State. government and like I, I mean I'm I I've been <laughs> guilty of this going into the into the booth and being like I know those big names like I don't know who all these people are who is this judge I guess I don't care. but <laughs> that that judge is the one who has the you know okay. has the, the the most you know time of saying guilty to a certain to certain like percentages of people you know and I should know that before I vote for him or don't vote, you know? So it's like, uh, start to research um, who your state legislators are, your local legislators, so that when you go in for your primary, you are knowledgeable as to what you're doing. And every acting student I ever work with, I say this and I say it's, it's as important in life as it is on the stage. People are what they do, not what they say. So do not listen to what a candidate tells you. Mm. Their record. Their record tells you the truth to who that person is. And if their voting, if their voting record says that they don't have your best interest at heart, don't listen to a word they tell you. Vote on their record, not on their words. And now is a good time to do that because we are in primary season. Just for those of us that are in Jersey, it's July 7th. Just want to throw that out there. Thank you. Um, but, you know, in the mail, you are now starting, or we are all starting to receive the information from these candidates. So now is a very good time for you to be able to research them because you don't have to go searching for who they are. They're all campaigning right now, you know? And so those flyers that come in your mail where they give you the, the, the ballot and who's running, take the time to look those names up. Google is free. 
Google is free. You know, so you don't really, so now is a great time because that information actually is coming to you if you pay attention to it. And if you happen to find a candidate, as they often are, on the street and want to talk to you, ask them questions. questions. What is important to you? Find out what their answer is to your question and whether or not they're going, they answer it the way you need and want them to. Absolutely. Okay, I'm getting off my soapbox. Um, so before we go, I just want to pass it over to Meseret because we have one more thing we want to do. Yes. First, we thank everybody for coming in, tuning out, tuning in, right? <laughs> Sitting on your couch and being with us tonight. And we want to just take this time to send our love to someone very special by saying... Happy birthday! And many more. I thank you all for tuning in. I want to remind you once again that once the stream is over, you can go back for a limited time, go back and uh, watch the, listen to the show again and, and watch this. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. <laughs>